Hello, as you said, I am uh, Philip Webb. Just recently defended my dissertation this summer, so the whole doctor thing is uh, welcome, but still a bit weird. Um, so as you said, um, I'm going to be talking about gates and their context today. Um, let me back up and say thank you guys for hosting me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uglo, for inviting me. And uh, I think this is a wonderful idea, these seminars to talk about uh, the Bible and biblical archaeology. I'm excited to be here, excited to share. Um, and like I said, I'm going to talk about gates. Um, hopefully, it's going to be more exciting than it might sound. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, sort of dive into this and maybe learn a little something. Um, but I am going to talk um, first about archaeology and uh, biblical background. So I am an archaeologist, uh, not a biblical scholar. Um, and there's a difference here, right? So uh, archaeology, biblical studies are two different disciplines. Um, and I'm sure you guys know this, but I'm going to sort of remind myself here. I'm not a biblical scholar. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh Biblical, uh, biblical data, but keep in mind, I, it's, not my, it's not my field, uh, it's not what I do, um, and I'm an archaeologist. Um, but while these two disciplines are different, each has their own methodology, each has their own uh, sort of customs and practices that you can do, um, and you know, archaeology, uh, we would study uh, Syria, Palestine, even if we didn't have the biblical text, uh, biblical scholars, uh, do their, their study without, uh, wouldn't need to consult archaeology. But when you bring them together, uh, you get this field of biblical backgrounds. Um, and, and biblical back backgrounds is really just this intersection of the two. That's how I, uh, how I think of, of biblical backgrounds. So um, it's a weird, kind of a weird uh, a study because uh, I'm an archaeologist and they're biblical scholars and uh, it's kind of weird you know, you kind of want to stay in your lane, right? I want to, I want to do archaeology, um, biblical scholars do biblical studies. Um, so you got to have to bear with me, particularly with the biblical, biblical data. But um, I think biblical backgrounds is important, even though this is a little uncomfortable dealing with biblical uh, material, uh, because this is a phrase that I hope you guys are familiar with. I hope you've heard before that the Bible is for us, but not to us. Um, and I think of biblical backgrounds, and it's, um, so do you guys, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Do you guys know anybody that uh, just speaks in pop culture references? Maybe you're that person. Uh, you know when you go hang out with them, they're going to reference a movie or a song lyric or a TV show, or some meme they saw on Reddit. Uh, you can, well, you'll know what they're talking about, right? Even if you haven't seen the movie, if you haven't heard the song, you'll know what they're talking about. Uh, but if you have seen that movie, if you've been to that Reddit page, you're going to have a much greater depth and understanding, right? So biblical backgrounds, in a sense, addresses this, that the biblical text is, has a message that you can read it, you can understand it. But there are these sort of pop culture references, that there are cultural references in the text that if you're not paying attention, if you haven't seen the movie, so to speak, you're going to miss that full depth. So... What I want to do today is to demonstrate uh, sort of an example of this, looking at gates. So hopefully uh, we can sort of see how biblical backgrounds can be done, one way it can be done, and then uh, looking specifically at gates, learn a little bit about uh, gates themselves. Where I want to end up is to have, hopefully after this, we can have an expansive view of the gate as an important place and social institution in ancient Israel, not just utilitarian space. So we're going to unpack this as we go. We're going to parse out some of these ideas. And how we're going to do this is we are going to start with the biblical data. Uh, again, not a biblical scholar, so I'm going to go through that as fast as I can. And then we're going to get to the archaeological data, and we're going to see how these things work together. So this is what I think of when I think of gates. Does anybody have a similar idea? Maybe? No? Um, so I Googled gates, and as much as Google is a stand-in for our collective conscious, 
this is what you get. These are stock images of gates. The one is uh, the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem. The rest are these medieval structures, right? The iron port colis. It's sort of separating out here from there. This is what, uh, and maybe this is my own thing I'm projecting onto you, but this is what I think of when I think of a gate. When you read it in the biblical text, uh, this is kind of what you imagine is this sort of structure that, you know, in a walled settlement that separates in from out, that can keep people out, keeps the besiegers out or whatever. Um, and that's true. That's, that's what gates do. Uh, but in ancient Israel, they had a much fuller, a much bigger function. Uh, we're going to be looking at that function today. So first of all, I want to look at the biblical data. Uh, gates are mentioned some 350 times in the Bible, and we're going to go through each and every one of them. No, no. Um, so what I want to do is we want to sort of get a feel for the totality of how gates are used in the Bible, right? There's a lot of different things that are associated with gates, and that's what we want to look at. And I want to sort of take a sample and uh, sort of look at the whole through looking at samples. Um, so what I've done, uh, relying on several other scholars, uh, is to sort of categorize or typologize the different functions of the gates, the di different ways gates are used in the Bible. So the obvious, right? Military and defensive function. You know, I'm not going to talk about all of these, and I just pulled out a couple examples. There's nothing special about these particular references, um, but hopefully you'll get the idea. So there are a lot of these uh, examples come from the Absalom story. Uh, this is David sitting between the two gates, which is something we can we'll see later. Uh, and there's very clear as watchman. He's he's waiting to see uh, how the results of battle battle is going to go. And this is a sort of obvious. Right? This is what you think of a gate. So it has a military and defensive function. Uh, but the Bible has a lot more to say about this, right? So the Bible talks about the gate as a political place. Again, in the Absalom story, Absalom is uh, standing beside the way of the gate. Now, it's not entirely clear what this is, if this is a road leading to the gate, the gate itself. Um, and he's saying, you know, to people come into the gates, and he's saying, you know, there should be somebody here. There should be a, the king or the king's representative. He's not here, but you know what? I'm here. He's sort of campaigning for himself, right? And he's doing this at the way of the gate. After uh, that rebellion, uh, David uh, takes over again, takes over as king, and he took his seat at the gate, sort of the resumption of normal order. This is where the king is. This is where the king does his duties. Uh, in Second Chronicles, again, uh, kings doing sort of court functions at the gate, okay? So uh, this is where political things happen. This is where the kings are. They do what kings do, right? That sort of performative display, arrayed in their robes, right? So the gate is also a very public gathering place. Um, you can see this uh, in the story of Boaz and Ruth. Uh, he, you know, the whole kinsman redeemer story, he goes up to the gate, all right, this is an intentional thing. He, he doesn't just, you know, he's not just going to the, some guy's house. He's not out in the fields. He goes up to the gate. He sat down there, and the elders are there, and there's this whole conversation about the kinsman redeemer happens at the gate. So, again, some of these kind of bleed together, but at, this is, the gate is a forum for public interactions. Uh, in Second Chronicles, the story of Hezekiah, he is gathering people together, and he's going to give this big sort of motivational speech. He gathers people at the gate, right? He could have gathered them at any, other, any number of places, but he gathers at the gate. This is also a market, area for commercial activity. So in Second Kings, there's this horrific story right, of uh, two mothers. Uh, Samaria is under siege by the Arameans, and one mother says to another, Today we'll eat your son, tomorrow we'll eat my son. So they kill and eat the one child, and then the next morning the other mother has hidden hers. So they go complain to the king. Uh, they, right? This is horrific. This is terrible, terrible uh, things going on. And the king blames Elisha. Uh, Elisha barricades himself in his house, and he then predicts deliverance in the form of a market forecast, in the commodities market, right? He says that tomorrow about this time a measure of fine meal shall be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria, right? So he's delivering, 
you know, uh, delivering this message about uh, food, right, uh, in the context of cannibalism, right? So he's saying tomorrow there's going to be a lot of food and it's going to be cheap. And the idea, if you can kind of read between the lines here, is that the prices are set at the gate, that uh, the gate is where this trade is happening, that uh, the prices for grain are set at the gate. In Genesis, going back into the Bronze Age with uh, the patriarchs, uh, Sarah dies and Abraham needs to bury her. He wants to bury her in a particular cave, in a particular field, and he goes to the gate. And at the gate, the, all the elders, all uh, the landowners are sitting there, and he negotiates the price for a field, a uh, very classic sort of Near Eastern negotiation, and he purchases this, uh, this field at the gate. So this transaction, it, this, again, could have happened at any number of places, but it happens at the gate. So cultic activity, archaeologists use the word cult to re refer to a lot of different things. Uh, if we don't know what something is, we call it cultic. Uh, but in the Bible, you see Josiah and his reforms. He uh, tears down the high place at the gate. Uh, this is reference referring to a particular gate, uh, but you can kind of extrapolate from this the idea that there are a lot of high places at the gate, uh, that there's a lot of cultic uh, non-Jerusalem worship going on at the gate. The gate also appears as a gathering area for the oppressed. Amos 5. Uh, again, you don't want to be the target of Amos 5. That's a very, very harsh passage, right? Um, and it's targeted against you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Proverbs 22, do not rob the poor because he is poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate. Again, there are a lot of different references like this in the Bible. I just pulled out two. Uh, but there's a very common association of uh, orphans, widows, foreigners, slaves, the people who are down on their luck. Uh, they gather at the gate. This is where they are. Um, and another uh, sort of example is the gate is even just a metaphor for the city. Uh, in Deuteronomy in particular, there's a phrase, your gates. Most translations will just go ahead and translate it as towns or city. Uh, they don't even bother to translate it as gates because this is just a sort of stand-in for the entire city. Hopefully your Bible translations will have a sort of footnote there to let you know that what's going on. Uh, but your gates is just a stand-in for, for, the, entire, for, for the whole. And the gate is also a place of justice. So again, in Deuteronomy, this they're talking about some capital offenses, uh, and if somebody breaks the law, or breaks makes a capital offense, where is the punishment take place? They go to the gate, and they don't take them outside the city. Uh, they don't take them to the palace. They don't do it sort of at a barracks. They do it at the gate. That is, this is where public justice takes place. Again, in Amos five, hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Okay, this. this Association with justice, justice and righteousness happening at the gate, uh, it's pretty common, in, in particularly in the prophets and poetic literature. And I want to take a little side excursion here and look at the king's role in justice. So justice takes place at the gate. Uh, justice is the job of the king. So in Second Samuel, David uh, is consolidating his rule, talks about all the different people that he's defeated, uh, and David administered justice and equity to all his people. And First Kings, this is the story of the Queen of Sheba. That the Lord loved Israel forever. He has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. Uh, in Psalm 72, give the king thy justice, O God, and thy righteousness to the royal son. May he judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with justice. So if justice and righteousness happen at the gate, this is the king's job. So there's this sort of connection here, if, if you kind of want to add or read between the lines here. Um, the king is supposed to have a role at the gate, and it already saw the political place. Okay, so again, we want to look at the totality here. You, I'm sure you could read uh, other, other biblical texts and maybe find other examples, other different functions at the gate, but that's a lot, right? It's not just blocking, separating in from out. There's a lot that's going on at the gate, right? The Bible indicates this, right? Have I made my point? Do I, right, we can go back and keep going. Um, but that's all good and all, but 
what is, what's the archaeology say? Could this have happened? Um, so what I want to do is now look at archaeology. This is, uh, again, getting to my, my field. What does archaeology show? Uh, and how does the archaeology match the biblical record? Uh, with keeping in mind questions of could all of these functions actually have happened at the gate? Is there evidence of this? And then what functions are detectable in the archaeological record? Spoiler alert, it doesn't look like all these functions could have happened at the gate structure. So how do we, how do we handle this? So going back to our original sort of thesis where we want to end up, I made this distinction between uh, an important place and utilitarian space. So this is an idea that you'll see in anthropology and architecture, uh, the distinction between space and place. So what is the difference? Sta space is static, nebulous, nebulous, and undifferentiated. Place is dynamic, imbued with meaning and symbolism. Right? That's some archaeology mumbo jumbo. Uh, we want some more mumbo jumbo. We can uh, say place is the center of felt value. It is a uh, lived space imbued with identity, memory, and other intangible elements that make it an integral part of the social lives of those who interact with it. Does that make any more sense? No. Um, so space and place are different in experience, right? Uh, when I was driving to campus here, it was my first time here, uh, I saw a lot of you know, dorm buildings. Don't, I have no experience there. That is, that is space. It, it doesn't have meaning to me. But for those of you who live there, this is, this is a place of felt value. This is a place that has meaning. Uh, you, know, if you can think of a, a park bench or a bench along the road. Uh, it's just a bench to me. But maybe that's you know maybe you are a runner and that's your sort of checkpoint. That's where you stop and end your run. And maybe uh, there's a bench where your significant other asked you out, or uh, you know there there are areas that can have meaning that don't have meaning to others. And what I'm suggesting is that a lot of times when we read the Bible, we see gates as space. It doesn't mean much to us. We don't have that experience. You know. DFW, where you know, I live up in DFW, doesn't have a gate, right? I have no sort of meaning for, for a gate. But for ancient Israel, this was an, a very important place. And we need to start thinking of it that way. Uh, we need to sort of understand the reference. 